Hello, everybody. Um, I hope you all had a really nice lunch, and thank you to all of our panelists and audience for being here today. Uh, my name is Sonia Sabrina Ralston. I'm the assistant curator for the Talent Architecture Biennale this year, and this panel is uh, I'll be moderating. But I'm a spatial practitioner and researcher, and I focus on the relationship between information technology and uh, scientific laboratories and how they produce uh, territory. So I'm currently a Master of Landscape Architecture student at the Harvard Graduate School of Design, and I hold a Master of Architecture from Princeton University. So I've, I've long been interested in Estonian architecture, um, so particularly the work that took place in rural collective farms uh, in the 1960s and 1980s by the likes of Thomas Rhein and Valve Pormeister and the AKE project at large. So very excited to be in Estonia. Um, so their experimental work uh, and formal designs were really, really exciting, but I think what um, makes this the most interesting to me uh, was how in the context of shoring up uh, modern agricultural practices, those spatial practitioners like, tirelessly bent the rules uh, and standards to carve out a space for their own work in an otherwise rigid aesthetic and logistical regime. So this interplay between architecture and geopolitics demonstrates the complexity of the ways in which the design of the built environment is tied to networks of, and systems of economic and political organization. So perhaps most importantly, uh, many of the relationships between architecture and territory, and not just in Estonia, but in the world at large, are played out through the very material concern of uh, the logistics of food production. So in, in creating hinterlands and centers, farms and cities, rural and urban areas, our material loops are intertwined and connected in a system of binaries that in fact are not binary at all. From the scale of the microbe to the floor plan to the regional plan, the geopolitical boundaries of production and are marked by a series of irrefutable entanglements that produce social and economic relationships and that are ultimately mediated by architecture and the built environment across many scales. So in, in this panel, our wonderful group of presenters will allow us to explore what it means to develop localized and circular economic thinking in both the city and farm from historical, contemporary, and projective uh, perspectives. So um, I'm going to invite all of our uh, presenters to the stage to sit and I'll introduce all of you at the same time. So please come up. <laughs> um, so speaking on behalf, uh, 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 our first presenters are Black Almanac, whose video-based work you can see in the main curatorial exhibition at the museum. Um, Black Almanac is a speculative design research platform that sees artificiality, alienation, and desire as key ingredients in the transformation of the global food system. Initiated in 2020 by Philip Mon, Andrea Provenzano, and Nikolai Medvedenko, the project brings together concepts, tools, case studies, and people for whom equitable, nutritious, ecologically sustainable, and joyful cuisine is the minimum viable requirement for food in the century to come. So speaking on behalf of Black Almanac are Philip Mon and Andrea Provenzano, and I'll introduce each of them. Uh, Andrea is an image maker and researcher from Italy. After training as a mechanical engineer, he switched to documentary photography and has recently expanded his practice to include algorithmic and computer-generated images, as in Black Almanac's Other Gardens, Visions of Agriculture Beyond Earth. And he is based in the Arctic region of Finnmark. Uh, Philip Mon is a writer and researcher from the UK. He covered the infamous horse meat scandal while working as a journalist in London and returned to the subject of food logistics uh, later while participating in the terraforming program at the Strelka Institute. He has worked for current affairs and culture magazines in London and Berlin, and his freelance writing explores food history, the philosophy of technology, and astrobiology. Um, so welcome. <laughs> our, our second presenter is Johan Tali, whose super green uh, project undertaken with this firm Malumba, you can see as part of the future food deal up at the museum. And Johan Tali is an architect, a doctoral candidate, and teaching staff at the Estonian Academy of Arts. And he's a founding member of Malumba. At ECA, he is also co-curator of the Open, Open Lecture Series, a member of the Unfinished City Research Institute, and um, supervisor of the Professional Studio. He was named the winner of the Young Architect Award in 2021 by the Estonian Association of Architects. And uh, in what seems to be a very busy year, he, and he also curated the City Unfinished Urban Visions exhibition at the Museum of Architecture, Estonian Architecture, which explored the many ways to think about planning in the city of Tallinn. And uh, an 
our last but not least presenter is uh, Ep Lenkotz, uh, who is an architectural historian and senior research fellow in the, at the Estonian Academy of Arts. And her research in interests include architecture and material culture under socialism and the historiography of modern architecture. She's written on social differentiation in the Soviet domestic sphere, the mingling of avant-garde and historiographic practices in Soviet architectural historiography. Her present research centers around the ideas of the socialist leisure society and how they were mediated into everyday environment during the 1960s and 1970s. She's the co-editor and co-curator of the award-winning book and the exhibition Leisure Spaces, Holiday and Architecture in 20th Century Estonia, which was also held at the museum in 2020. So um, without further ado, like, let's get started. I invite Philip to come speak. Hi everyone, it's wonderful to be here. First of all, I want to say thank you uh, for the invitation to Lydia and Areti, our tireless curators. Uh, also to Sonia for hosting the panel and for all of her work uh, towards the Biennale. Also to Ivan and Ronya, who I, I think uh, uh, I gave a really hard time to with uh, sending video files late and all that kind of stuff, but hopefully she'll forgive us. So Black Almanac began as a speculative design project, uh, but has slowly taken on a life of its own in the material world. Our hope for the longer term is to create a resource and a point of connection for people interested in new ways of thinking about the food system, regardless of whether their role is as a food producer, a chef, a technologist, or simply as an eater. The Greek historian and geographer Herodotus famously visited and wrote about the opening of the Nile River. And in fact, it's Herodotus who's credited with the comparison of the river's broad alluvial banks to the Greek letter delta. Of course, this is a triangle to you and me. Um, in maths, the delta symbol means change. And this is an appropriate inheritance from a site intrinsically connected to the early days of agriculture. Ancient Egypt was historically referred to as the black land, as opposed to the red land that surrounded it, that's the desert. In fact, the Coptic word, keme, is believed to have been borrowed and used as the Arabic al kimya or alchemy, alchemy, the root that ultimately in English became chemistry. When we discuss the climate impacts of agriculture today, we are compelled to recognize the chemical foundation that undergirds the special category of matter we humans delineate as food. Even if, from the point of view of the universe, our categories are indistinguishable from the continual churning, mixing, assembly, and disassembly of atoms that predates us and will continue after we're gone. Chemistry is an expansion and a professionalization of cooking, a synthetic practice born from the domestic transformation of raw into cooked that enabled us to spread into and transform every corner of the planet. Today we boast about how we know our way around the kitchen, but the fact is we have very little idea what actually is going on in the fields that, reshape, that, uh, that are reshaped by what we're doing in the kitchen. So we chose the name Black Almanac, not only in reference to the fertile soils of the Nile River Delta, but also to the wealth of knowledge in soil ecology, genomics, agro-robotics, and farm analytics that still needs to be created. And for the knowledge that does already exist, but currently remains locked away due to business practices, geo geopolitical rivalries, aggressive IP laws, or even a lack of computational infrastructure. Almanacs are some of the oldest surviving texts that we have. Ancient databases that structured farming practice and provided a site for speculation about our place within the cosmos. Yet there's nothing like a farmer's almanac today, creating instead a vacuum into which performative politics and corporate PR floods to structure contemporary food discourse. Black Almanac wasn't intended to be a uniform holistic almanac, but rather to highlight this breach, this gulf, this emptiness. Uh, we, we instead see it as functioning as a sort of read-write ledger towards a new kind of cooking. And when I say cooking, I think we can, we can consider this a practice that takes place in, in software as much as it does in kitchens. Our work at Talon takes the form of a glossary of terms, 
uh, some of which I'll allude to in a moment. You can see examples on the slide there. Um, there are two videos and there's a printout that people can take home and digest at their leisure. We're also going to publish a small book next uh, month called Cooking Earth. This is going to coincide with a week of programming at Media Lab Matadero in Madrid, where we're going to be joined by chefs, designers, artists, engineers, and chemists to, dis to question the source of our everyday anxieties around food, to study blockages preventing transformation in the broader food system, and to imagine food futures that do not presently exist. So in our two years of research up to this point, uh, three core themes, or maybe we might say ingredients, uh, have repeatedly emerged. Those are artificiality, desire, and alienation. These are not generally the sorts of word you might, words you might encounter when you visit the organic foods aisle at the supermarket. In fact, I would say today's brand of conscious consumerism is very likely to reject these words outright. However, we're not positing these three as, a, as any kind of a solution, but rather trying to highlight through research the way they have been integral in explaining why the food system is the way it is. What do I mean by this? So, to consider artificiality first. Recent research in archaeology and anthropology reveals to us that as far back as 12,000 years ago, which is to say before the rise of mechanized agriculture, humans had already transformed three quarters of the Earth's land surface using techniques such as burning, domestication, species propagation, and crop cultivation. This first terraforming was a chaotic, brutal, uh, brutal process powered by basic evolutionary drives, which now must be replaced by a deliberate sense-based terraforming of the earth that can absorb what we know now that we did not know then. Not only is the past more artificial than is generally accepted, but so is the present. Every day, governments worldwide spend around a billion dollars on perverse subsidies, primarily for livestock rearing, rearing and commodity crops. This makes disruption almost impossible, whether that be in the form of technological innovation, new farming methods, or even new food cultures, recipes, and food products. As for our desires, we may consider our deepest and most primitive sense, which is the sense of smell. When life first moved on Earth, it did so to capture food. The biochemical term for the movement of cells towards external stimuli is chemotaxis. In our case, as conscious complex organisms, taste and smell are created in response to molecules in our environment that trigger a neural cascade which passes through the emotion, learning, and memory processing uh, centers in the brain before we become aware of them. In this way, smell is both automatic, as automatic as breathing, yet as intimate as dreaming a local drive with global repercussions. We often assume that people have historically been forced out of food production. It's a kind of commonplace that I've heard a couple of times in the last couple of days. But what we might do instead is pay attention to some of the accounts that emerge from the historic record and consider some of the reasons people might have had for wanting to pursue other things. Access to safe, affordable, easy meals is not often cited as a vehicle of liberation. But in the absence of supermarkets, restaurants, and delivery services, the daily challenge of reproducing bodies while keeping them healthy was the principal concern of all but the rich. To quote the food historian Rachel Loudon, and if you don't know her, you must look her up. Her book, Cuisine and Empire, is a masterpiece. To quote Rachel Loudon, until the arrival of the tortilla machine in 1950s Mexico, women without servants could expect to spend five hours a day, one third of their waking hours, kneeling at the grindstone, preparing the dough for the family's tortillas. Finally, alienation. Some of the worst ways to produce food have been enshrined in a cultural semiotics of pastoral nostalgia that is re reproduced daily in children's books, food advertising, video games, TV shows, and just suffused within the broader culture. These agrarian simulations, and that's our glossary term, agrarian simulations are so deep deeply embedded that we do not question them and find departures from what is perceived as traditional to be threatening or sinister. And yet the history of technological change or the arrival of unusual foods from one culture to another has seen alienation, alienation often as its first spark. Think about the elevation of lobster from a bottom feeding parasite farmers didn't even want to feed to their animals to a symbol of excess or the widespread embrace of Japanese classics like raw tuna or matcha, neither of which my Irish dairy farmer grandparents would have recognized as edible food. Embracing alienation means recognizing our own alienness 
at the home, uh, as a home to billions of microorganisms who made symbiotic pacts inside the bodies of our ancestors, as well as the sublime planetary metabolism of which food is a major part. In this way, food becomes a medium for transformation that requires us to reject our assumptions about what is naturally given so that we can look directly at our problems and begin to build again. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Um, Johan? So I'm not so much going to talk about <clears throat> farming, but um, politics, um, because um, <clears throat> when you think about it, what the project Super Green wanted to look at is how you actually initiate change, and one of those ways is actually political will. So the background story is that um, I think in 2005, European Council initiated a prize to be handed out to a city every year, uh, which was uh, titled European Green Capital of that year. And this was actually uh, announced in Tallinn by the local mayor uh, at that time, Yuri Ratas. And ever since that time, Tallinn actually wanted to be European Green Capital. Um, and what this uh, kind of project or this uh, capital does is addresses sustainability and how we actually uh, live as a city. So the project Super Green is actually, uh, it's a hoax. It's, uh, it's a made up campaign because we see year after year Tallinn trying to uh, uh, become the European green capital and never really making it. Uh, this year, actually when we did the project, parallel to that, a few months later, they actually won. So I'm going to talk about the parallel universe to what is actually happening in reality. And actually our project, uh, which was done in collaboration with the philosopher Eik Hermann and uh, Carly Luik and uh, Harry Kaplan and uh, anne Christine Ensen from our office, is actually a kind of a parody of this campaign. And uh, I think a campaign, uh, a political campaign, is a very funny instrument also if in terms of architecture, because it's actually a plan. It's a promise of things about to happen when things go someone's way. So Supergreen is a, is a plan as well of, of what would happen if uh, Tallinn would become uh, European green capital and what would they do. Uh, so the plan was, this is all kind of like what the, what the, what the let's say, the campaign office fought. Uh, okay, I have to say one more thing. This was a, a kind of exhibition piece for Estonian Architecture Museum's anniversary exhibition, and w which asked for uh, uh, a project that would uh, be as a response to kind of disasters of the world uh, and how we would change the world with one building or a project. So we said, okay, we need to do one thing in Tallinn to fix all the sustainability issues. Uh, we need to uh, take uh, the Lasnama Canal, which uh, probably you know from the Visions competition. It's this uh, modernist uh, prefab housing district in Tallinn that has a kind of central canal. And then the campaign office, which, uh, uh, which, uh, well, okay, the background story is that uh, Lasnama is a kind of segregated big part of Tallinn, which actually gives pretty much uh, the big majority of the votes for whoever is in power. And for, the, I think, 20 years or even longer, the central party has been in power pretty much on the votes of Lasnama. So this is a kind of nod to Lasnama people and then to have uh, the project be really kind of centered around them. So it would be a pilot project and these kind of uh, super green structures would uh, then follow in the rest of the city as well. Uh, also, this kind of idea of a super kind of mega structure, which would be basically a building stretching from the city center to the edge of the city in this canal, would be uh, pretty much in line with this kind of metabolist ideas. And what we also discovered is that if you flip the map of Tallinn, it really resembles a human body, and it was, this would become the throat. Uh, the actual exhibit in the, in the museum was uh, a kind of uh, 
freeze frame of, of that campaign being rolled out. So it's uh, all kinds of uh, merchandise that would, uh, that would need to be handed out to the, uh, to the people once uh, the campaign actually would go. And it would be kind of fragments of these discussions of the bureaucracy that needs to be uh, uh, put in place in order to actually make this project happen. It would be leaflets of what would actually happen in the canal. It would be postcards of actual spaces inside that canal. So ideally, or the idea is that uh, the canal will be covered with a tensile uh, roof and inside there will be a kind of artificial, uh, artificial climate of uh, of uh, different zones. So these would be these kind of promises of what this uh, megastructure would do. Uh, they are kind of anecdotal. So uh, the first one would be kind of beautiful natural landscapes of Estonia as a kind of museum exhibit. So you would have bogs and different types of uh, natural landscapes. Then you would have real farming as aquaphonics. Then you would have as we're talking about sustainability and mo moving towards a more sustainable city, and Tallinn is uh, still a city that car use is growing, so the modal split is still leaning towards more cars. So there would be a place where you could actually hand off your car and you would get credits and you would get uh, redemption. So as you uh, probably noticed, we're really talking about greenwashing all the way. So we would also have a greenhouse where you would have Tallinn bananas as a kind of special breed of bananas that you would be handing out. Then you would have these small pots of co-working on sustainable projects. You would have uh, waste disposal. You would have uh, different types of kind of waste sorting. You would have obviously a public amenity to kind of say that this is a, for everyone to use, which is a beach. And you would have this kind of... Uh, theme park of uh, prehistoric or kind of uh, paleo uh, lifestyle. So really kind of small hints of, of, of all these kind of conflicts and struggles that we're, we're kind of looking into when, uh, when discussing uh, how to live more sustainable. Uh, and as a kind of climax to this, uh, it, I mean, it's a linear structure and on top of it, there's this uh, air cable tram that uh, drives throughout Lasnama and, and kind of linked to history is that always in the canal there was supposed to be a tram, but it never happened. So now we kind of follow through with the old promise of modernists and say that there's an air cable tram uh, and it leads to um, a former pl power plant um, which has been completely refurbished into a greenhouse, but it actually serves more as a kind of cathedral of uh, greenwashing. Uh, I mean, we really took it uh, seriously, but we actually had a lot of fun with these ideas. So it's a, it's a kind of combination of, of, of really like, of uh, all this kind of green thinking. And we really found that this kind of, uh, uh, how do you call it? Like this uh, greenwashing really is a religious, uh, it has religious kind of uh, ideas embedded into it. So it's really like this cathedral of green thinking. Uh, the structure is actually there right now as well, so we keep the structure, but we really uh, turn it into a, a greenhouse. And uh, these slides are just to kind of show the different promises that the super green does. So first of all, it uses exi existing structures. Uh, it's trying to shift the energy production from something fossil fuel based into a more kind of contemporary and s probably solar based, as you see with the panels on top of the structure. It's trying to uh, kind of reassemble these infrastructure ob objects as uh, multifunctional and layered. So none, none of them really matter so much as single objects, but once you combine them, they become purposeful. Um, and it really tries to evaluate what, what's being done and uh, really if, if it actually pr produces uh, benefits and if so then we keep it if not we get rid of it so it's a kind of uh, always a calculation of all these kind of parts assembled into a, a really kind of messy uh, uh, kind of uh, object or kind of space in the end uh, and it's resilient and it's actually always in progress it's always in, in the move it's changing once the times are changing 
And it's uh, also kind of bringing in uh, these different uh, constellations of, uh, of what used to be uh, kind of separate in farmlands and somewhere outside outskirts. It's really combining them all together. Uh, so it's it's really it's a, it's an amusement park. It's it's basically meant to be exactly the same thing as Heatherwick's vessel in New York. So you basically climb on top. So it's really like a tongue-in-cheek. Uh, also, in terms of this kind of uh, Bilbao architecture being uh, the kind of in, in the middle of things, uh, <clears throat> and it's really like a place of praise. Uh, it really becomes like a community center. And um, this is the last slide, so it's, uh, it's serious, uh, but it's, take, uh, it's not taking fun out of it. So uh, it is a myth, uh, but it's, it's trying to kind of address our past. And um, for a campaign, you also need the logo and you need uh, a symbol. So this is the kind of warped logo of Tallinn, which is, uh, it's the, in Tallinn's logo is this blue flag. So we, but for environmental uh, campaigns, you need a cute animal. So we took uh, the flag from Tallinn and the green uh, cute uh, frog, and we wrapped it in this uh, plan of the, of the cathedral. Um, yeah, that's uh, the end of the campaign. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Johan. I, I also love cute animals, so Ep, please. <laughs> Okay, hello, uh, good afternoon. So thank you for the um, invitation to speak, um, uh, the curators, uh, also Sonia, um, and also for this challenge to um, uh, consider that material I'm um, uh, working with from the viewpoint that perhaps is not uh, being really central um, uh, to my approach. So however, these localizations and, and non-linear patterns that are central to this um, uh, event um, certainly appear also in these uh, modern uh, spaces that I'm particularly interested in, and um, uh, which, uh, for instance, uh, Sh Sheila uh, Jasanoff or uh, Sang Hyun Kim rather prominently have um, described as social technical imaginaries, uh, which are uh, collectively held uh, visions of uh, desirable futures or, or common good uh, attainable through the advances of science and, um, and technology. And the uh, leisure and um, also the uses of nature for that purpose, uh, which were extensively studied uh, in different research projects in, um, uh, during socialism, uh, were well, one of those um, imaginaries. Um, and they brought about uh, a noticeable uh, change uh, in built environment and everyday life during late socialism. And um, I hope also uh, that the case study that I, had, I have chosen for today, the, the Socialist Summer House, hopefully shows that these imagined orders uh, were also changeable and um, loose around the uh, edges. So my 10 minute sketch uh, is really based on an Estonian example and um, the time does not allow me to go deeper into, um, into culture specific uh, differences within the Eastern Bloc or, or even within um, Estonia. Yeah. So to set the scene uh, very, very quickly, um, the Soviet food supply, um, as we know, uh, relied on uh, large industrial agriculture, which was based on this binary food production system, which were uh, the state-owned farms and then state-controlled large collective farms, which were basically a kind of a pseudo-cooperative organizations, not truly um, uh, collectively owned. So these large farms were responsible for uh, feeding the nation and uh, producing uh, surplus for exporting to allies. Uh, they gave almost all the countries uh, uh, grain uh, for the bread and cereal products, but also meat, eggs and milk. Um, collectivization um, and food supply was also at the center uh, of Stalin's famous campaign from 1948, which was the, uh, the great 
plan for the transformation of uh, nature, which was a massive undertaking to improve agricultural performance uh, by geoengineering technologies, afforestation, uh, but also what what is much less known fact that um, encouraging collective gardens and um, small subsidiary households was also part of this um, heroic scheme. Um, and um, so this was not actually a grassroots initiative. So these small gardens, they gained full momentum only during Khrushchev's time. Uh, when another campaign, which was the third uh, Communist Party program, which Khrushchev released in 1961, basically, which is known as a kind of a roadmap to communism, uh, which set the raising the living standards of, um, of the citizens of the Soviet Union as its key strategy. Uh, and I'm sorry that I actually have a, a, a slide, uh, which is basically another campaign for leisure, which doesn't fit to the speech, but I, but it didn't have to tie it time to change it in the, in the end. So um, this, there are just two propaganda posters. Um, so they're both from actually from the Stalinist period. Sorry for this. Um, so most notably, this campaign, this Khrushchev campaign, was centered around the housing question, but, uh, but also in the increase of leisure time. So the 1960s was the time when the five-day work, work week was introduced in the Soviet Union instead of the former uh, six-day work week. And also, um, you know, um, providing infrastructure for, for um, increasing free time uh, was also part of this campaign. So this kicked off uh, um, a massive spread of summer houses uh, and garden plots. Um, so, and just like collectivization transformed the rural landscapes uh, into urban-like uh, central agricultural settlements, the summer houses and the garden plots uh, changed considerably the urban peripheries around uh, the eastern uh, European cities uh, uh, in, in the 1960s to 1980s. Um, there were small manually operated gardens uh, and although most of the, you know, they were meant for personal subsistence, uh, they also contributed to the um, supply of vegetables, fruits and berries, but also honey, as the surplus also ended up uh, in state retail dealers and then food production. <clears throat> So active and productive holiday and uh, you know, supplementing the national food supply was a rationale uh, for the individualism the summer cottages represented. Also, like other public control mechanisms were applied, uh, like the ownership form uh, that was based on institutional ties actually. So you could acquire a plot which was a size about uh, 600 to 1200 square meters. They were distributed only through your workplace, so you actually had to form a cooperative together with your colleagues. And uh, the land was provided by the state, though, though, and usually it was not fertile enough for the large-scale agriculture, and so it was given away uh, for small size um, uh, food production. And uh, the cooperative had to order a master plan for the area and, you know, work up the land um, for themselves. So not only building, but also um, gardening uh, was subjected to regulations as the state kept the record of all the berry bushes and apple trees, um, and because there were occasional inspections uh, and the cooperatives had to report, for instance, for the kind of statistical service the state organized. Um, as with food provision, uh, the model of the self-sufficiency was equal at play in constructing those settlements. The small-scale individual con construction was not subordinated to um, the strict centrally imposed rules of cost-effectiveness, but the designs for these simple modernist houses, which were usually made of uh, wood or wooden structure, uh, either standard or one-off, uh, had to rather strictly to stick to the 25 square uh, meter floor space limitation. The owner had to find the ways to organize construction materials, which was quite an achievement in the state uh, where the um, demand and supply logic worked according to rather distorted principles when compared to the market economies at the time. Uh, and they were mostly self-taught, the builders, um, uh, supported by simple instructive um, uh, literature that was also published uh, widely. And so the whole process of constructing and managing the, the house and the garden was based on various resource uh, circulation. For instance, um, um, it's a known fact that um, in Estonia uh, that the 1967 um, a big storm gave a kind of a boost to uh, constructing these areas as the blown down timber was allowed to be collected and used for construction materials. 
but also other kinds of uh, resources uh, circulated like seeds or plants or, or you know how and uh, in some occasions uh, even the uh, receipts um, for construction materials changed hands as um, occasionally there were inspections uh, where your um, financial documents were were controlled or inspected um, you know, you know that you had to prove that you actually bought those materials in order to hinder them. That the formal economy that was um, uh, also very noticeably present in uh, in Soviet Union. Um, so by the 1980s, uh, approximately 10 to 13 percent of the population was engaged in this kind of productive holidaying uh, in the garden, and so this self-built slow rise, we can call it seasonal settlements. Uh, because they were often in process for, for many, many years, or the suburbia, uh, as we can also call them, uh, shaped the ground for new urban lifestyles to emerge in the post-socialist suburbia in the 1990s, uh, where the questions of privacy and um, family life became particularly manifest. Uh, and although masked behind the subsistence farming, um, mm, the representations of the so-called good life uh, were already present uh, in, in those very first designs. And as such, uh, the summer houses were a site where this kind of leisurely, new leisurely lifestyle that, that Khrushchev had promised uh, became rooted. Um, and appropriating um, this reductionist aesthetic of the normative space, uh, they also accommodated um, connotations of idleness and excitement. For instance, roofs um, were like A-frames, uh, which were the most popular, really, really very, very popular, a lot of used uh, typology. Um, or kind of saddle-like roofs, um, which kind of transform the experiences um, of the everyday environment of a square corner um, city um, apartment, or spaces like uh, walled enclosures that mark the boundaries of the, the family space within that larger uh, collective, or you know sp spaces like terraces or pools. Um, that conveyed uh, pleasant bodily uh, experiences. So this is just a short um, tour into this historic topology that is perhaps capable of uh, showing how these clear-cut divisions um, uh, or boundaries between urban and rural and uh, urban progress and manual work in the, in the labor uh, become fractured and uh, how the state interests like food security intersect or, or get injected with elements that might serve controversial to those imagined orders, but um, they are necessary in order to uh, ensure its uh, stability. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ep. Okay, fantastic presentation. Um, and thank you to all of you. This very exciting uh, things that we were talking about. So I'm, I'm excited for all the ample fodder we have to talk about. Um, I guess maybe I'll start with uh, one question. Uh, all of you have this really interesting way that you think about standards and artificiality, um, whether it's from uh, the Black Almanac team thinking about the kind of standards or artificiality we have in our relationships to food, or Johan and your uh, questioning of what does it mean to have you know, a very artificial campaign for greenwashing and how do you achieve some kind of real climate justice, and Ep with your thinking about these kinds of standards of uh, Soviet design that were very restrictive but were able to be played with in a really uh, amazing way and in late socialism. Um, I guess, yeah, so what, so maybe to what degree um, when you're exploring these ideas are, is, are standards and artificiality important to kind of uh, boundaries for you to play against, but also important in maybe the historical context that you're, you're looking at? I don't know, um, maybe if you, if you would like to start, <laughs> um, uh, Philip or Andrea. <laughs> uh, um, I can start, I can start by, defining how we, uh, what we mean with artificial, artificiality because uh, institution 
for us are artificial. Philip mentioned the example of subsidies uh, and, and the perversion that they introduce in the food system and how they keep on like the artificial way we produce system has, as a bad example of artificiality. Uh, in the Almanac, we also have another example, which is the one of, uh, yeah, I'm gonna drop the bad words, GMO. And uh, we, we like to joke about it that like, people don't hate GMO, but people hate uh, intellectual property. So uh, we often are scared by, of course, the unknown, all the problem, the, the problematics can, can emerge by new technologies, uh, but sometimes they are just there to obfuscate uh, to a problem that it's much bigger, that it's much more problematic, like the intellectual property behind the genetically modified organisms, uh, which are, according to many scientists uh, at this point, uh, I feel confident to say, safe. Uh, the problem is that uh, the patent uh, attached to these um, organisms, seeds, uh, and um, uh, it's, it's owned by a, the, a, large, a large part of this patent is owned by a, by a very few amount of corporations. And the access to the information required to use them, it's limited. So we have a good mo what we think to be a good model of artificiality, which is the synthesis of organism. And then we have a bad model of artificiality, which is the enforcement of intellectual property that limits the access to a good artificiality. It's a nicely uh, ambiguous word, and I like when you were describing the way that we'd all approached it, uh, you, you kind of uh, highlighted that, how it tips into superficiality very easily, and also uh, fakeness, you know, something that's not reliable. I mean, at its root, when we talk about artificiality, I think we're talking about design. We're talking about something that was in some way uh, sculpted. And, um, you know, food is not really viewed that way, even though it is entirely designed. You know, humans are a, a species of animal that cooks, and that cooking is a design process. Um, and you know, it doesn't have to be gene, you know, CRISPR gene editing in the present. All of the species of, of plants that we ingest were designed over generations through cultivation, breeding, selection. Uh, these are ancient technologies. Um, and I think that uh, one, of the, the, one of the primary barriers to uh, I mean, I made the point, I suppose, already, but one of the primary barriers to uh, entry into food system change is this uh, kind of rejection of the notion of constructedness that I think should be applied to food. I mean, when you go into a restaurant, this is a, a sensory engineering uh, thing, you know, like menus or interfaces. There are all these levels of entry, there are all these entry points for design uh, with, with this kind of phenomenon that we refer to as food. And, um, and I think that, uh, yeah, this is why we, we, we emphasize uh, artificiality first and foremost, because it's everywhere. Okay, now it's on. First of all, artificiality, there's, there's almost like a, in the concept of a European green capital, that's an artificial title. First of all, it's not handed out to the greenest city in Europe. It's, it's kind of the opposite. It's handed out to uh, the one that needs to kind of uh, boost up their game. Uh, so it's, it's more like a helping package to uh, for kind of reach kind of more sustainable goals. And uh, the whole kind of competition is to kind of have different cities with, uh, with their own inherent problems to kind of face those problems and come up with a package of how they solve those problems. So this whole kind of uh, title or this award is very artificial in order to kind of boost something um, which is, let's call it sustainability. And if you think about it, also to kind of address sustainability uh, from kind of like a political point of view is also a very artificial uh, way of operating because one would think that us living in an urban environment would be over time kind of a sustainable thing, but it's not. So we, we really have to kind of artif 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 artificially uh, uh, boost it. We really have to kind of check and uh, I think the other part of the question was about kind of standardization and our project is really looking at uh, what's the industry standard so to say. What's, what's the mechanism that actually 
operates the city, like the city government, how they operate. And actually, we did, I didn't talk about it too much, but we even had, uh, we looked into kind of meeting minutes and protocols of uh, what was written down and what was discussed in the meetings. And it was a lot of empty air. And uh, in the kind of end sentences, uh, I think the conclusion was, we take all information as knowledge. Uh, so it basically it was like, okay, we... We, okay, we hear you, but uh, not much of it actually carries through into real policies. But once it's done as a kind of package, as a campaign, uh, you, it loses a bit of seriousness because uh, it's more like a promise of things. Uh, and we're really interested in, in how many things we can actually promise through architecture as a kind of uh, one-liner almost. Uh, and that... It actually, in our previous work and also in the research about the city, the, the way these things are done is very quick. I mean, if someone comes up with an idea that we need to have a new stadium, it's not like you design a stadium to show that this is the design of the stadium. You design the image of the stadium. You, it's very much about images, it's about the ideas. And it's not so much about following through with the ideas, but rather to put them out there, to boost something. So I think that's the also kind of funny way of uh, industry standard, so to say, in Tallinn. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Yeah, standards, uh, you definitely, you know, you won't pass them by uh, talking about Soviet architecture, but but basically, I think the case study was a bit about uh, um, uh, passing by those standards, but, but this was not something that was actually uh, somehow happening uh, outside, let's say, this authoritative system. Uh, let's say that, um, you know, the production systems of Soviet Union were rather unflexible. And so these kinds of appropriations of the standards... Um, well, not in mass production, let's say, but in kind of smaller scale, were, were rather common, but, but at the same time, um, uh, you know, uh, there, were, there were a lot of research done uh, in 60s and 70s, a lot of expertise, uh, knowledge transfer available, which, which kind of worked through, uh, on, worked on more diverse solutions that actually the, you know, uh, the production uh, could manage. So, for instance, there were different housing typologies for different family types, you know, uh, uh, for, for those who live by themselves and so on. So this was just basically the kind of, um, they, they were incapable of implement, the implementation was poor. So this is something where this kind of playing around with the standards uh, come along, but at the same time it was, well, not favored is perhaps not the, but the correct term, but, but, but it was legitimate and not not truly perhaps uh, controlled in a sense that we might imagine uh, about talking about Soviet um, building system. Mm. Yeah, yeah well, well, that's uh, really interesting to think about because um, I, I mean, I know that there's there's so much, it's a very complicated history, so, but um, I, I think it's really interesting that you're bringing this up because um, when I was listening to also all of you talk and think about this, it was kind of the degrees of access or um, kind of agency that people have in the ability to implement their ideas. So um, a lot of you were talking about kind of um, the expertise of an architect or to some degree or a spatial practitioner and what kind of ways that they can shape uh, food or food cultures um, broadly considered but um, I guess what I was what I was thinking about when you were all talking is that how how can um, how can you uh, incur kind of positive social or economic changes as maybe a designer or um, even not even as a designer, but someone who is maybe a writer or historian, um, but even beyond that, um, you know, the, the women that you're referencing who are making tortillas for several hours a day. So how can you kind of bring together that expertise in order to affect a kind of social technical change? And also um, with our discussion about artificiality, how do you do that in a way that's actually meaningful um, but I guess that, that is kind of the question, so <laughs> I don't know how you feel about responding to that. Maybe you've just put on your hat, so... <laughs> yeah, I guess the, the easy answer is you get people on board. Uh, first of all, you campaign really hard and you... Uh, because bottom line, I think um, these kind of political campaigns, they only matter to politicians. Uh, 
I guess the big issue is of how to actually kind of shift it around. So to really be more centered around the individual or kind of the, the, the actual inhabitants of the city. Uh, and this is a big question, like, because I think change actually happens not on a kind of political level, but it actually happens when all the inhabitants of the city understand the need for a change. And um, yeah, our strategy, as you see, was to kind of have the frog be a kind of iconic symbol and to kind of resemble or to kind of mean something and then to have everyone wear the hat and then it would kind of uh, seed itself. I mean, uh, yeah, when this question, which we in, at, at panels, you know, like at, at Viennales and things always comes up, like, you know, how can we do X, you know, it kind of is the source of anxiety that I was referring to earlier, because you're, you're kind of assuming that any one of us has the capacity, not you, you know what I mean, <laughs> one is assuming that, 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 that any individual has the capacity uh, to kind of knock down the first domino that will uh, kind of lead to the you know, ecological, sustainable paradise that we all desire. I mean, this is, I think, the entry point for our project in a sense, because we immediately see that uh, this kind of individualism is really uh, deep at every level of the culture, whether it be kind of in, uh, you know, the, the corporations are happy with it, the governments are happy with it, um, precisely because it, uh, it actually kind of blocks any opportunity for a collective kind of, um, you know, population level kind of change. Um, and even then, I mean, that, that's something that I think, <sighs> the food system is, is a complex system. It has emergent properties. There's kind of no individual who can kind of change it. It's out of control. It's monstrous. I mean, it truly, <laughs> it's truly this enormous thing. And so I think by looking at, you know, historic moments of, uh, you know, when new, new foods have come along or, um, you know, uh, new, new typologies in architecture, uh, you know, and the kind of ripple out effects that they've had, uh, you know, this is how we, we came to things like, you know, the, the libidinal power of the drive towards flavor. You know, this is how uh, we came to looking at kind of uh, the, the effect that uh, certain technologies have had. I mean, there's, uh, you know, this kind of uh, classic example that, that people give quite often, but, you know, we didn't, we didn't stop abusing horses because we realized it's bad to abuse horses. We, we stopped because the car came along. And so technology in this regard is not, um, you know, it's also not something that's really under anybody's particular control. However, I do think that there, there's kind of uh, a lot more attention needs to be paid to uh, the kind of who gets to do the innovation, where is the money, for, where, how is the funding? I mean, I don't know if how much discussion there's been so far about like, you know, investment in ag tech. It's functioning like, uh, you know, Silicon Valley sort of metrics and models right now. And again, like the kind of raw market kind of principles probably shouldn't be uh, sort of... Um, applied to, to, to food production. Um, anyway, do you want to, can you? No, no, I, I can double down on the anxieties generated by this hyper-individualization of the politics around food, right? We, in the Almanac, uh, we, we included this, this, this chapter where we show a billboard, an actual billboard by Coca-Cola that says, uh, if, you don't re if you don't help us recycli recycling, uh, don't buy Coca-Cola. Right, uh, which is like blaming the customer. Like, like it's as much your responsibility as ours, but that's not the case. Like we completely normalize this. Uh, and, and yeah, I don't think it's fair. Like uh, I should be, feel free to buy Coca-Cola and then recycle if I can or recycle if I cannot. Uh, but I think Coca-Cola should be held responsible for the damage it caused by their product. Uh, they are making profit out of that, right? Yeah. It, it stops us from seeing where the damage takes place. And I think probably this is something we'll get onto uh, down the line in terms of city and hinterland and so on. But, uh, you know, it's in the same way that the majority of waste in the food system by like, the vast majority of waste takes place at the point of production. And yet we only ever discuss the point of consumption because it's the thing that we see. And this question of like what's visible and how to get beyond that uh, is definitely something we're we're kind of interested in. I mean, that's what this, I mean, the almanac is a speculative idea, but it's the idea, the reason for that is that it, it points to this, 
this absence, you know, and, and we start thinking about what we can design, what kind of institutions, what kind of social technologies can exist in order to, uh, you know, to bring people into that conversation space. I just want to say that this is not a way to just wash our hands and say like, oh, we are not responsible, we shouldn't I do about recycle, that. Honestly, I do recycle, honestly, I do. And you understood. <laughs> Oh, I just said I do my recycling, you know, like. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's great that you recycle. Well. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm an historian, feel rather uncomfortable, you know, saying architects or designers how you should bring about positive change. But, uh, you know, perhaps, you know, looking, looking the, in the history of the material study, perhaps it's the, it's really the, uh, the scale of uh, every individual or the, or the human experience that you really need feed, really need to feel the everyday life change, like this brings about some positive uh, impacts, like on the case, perhaps this small garden plot or something. So perhaps this is the scale <laughs> to consider. Well, very fair. I, I'm, I'm sorry to ask you as a historian to make comments on us designers. Um, but I guess, so maybe to return to kind of to the name of the panel, which is uh, Farm in the City. So. Um, which I think is already a very funny uh, binary to have. But so maybe for each of you, and Philip, you just touched on this, but to, how, to what degree is your work view the city and farm as something separate? And um, do you think that the hinterland to urban center model is something that you ascribe to or in, your his, in the historical work that you look back on? Um, uh, perhaps not. I mean, um, I, I think the term hinterland here is a bit problematic. Um, in terms of, basically, you can't kind of even separate the uh, urban or the rural in the, in the case that I was talking about, because the uh, the gardens, who does it, they, they, they actually functioned as a as a addition to the urban apartment. In a way, they are the same. Uh, it's just located a bit <laughs> further down, but. Uh, but I wouldn't. Uh, I don't think that hinterland is something to consider here in terms of economic ties. So um, there are no other. Uh, basically, these were like these grasslands or some I don't know unfertile lands which were kind of cultivated. There was no. Often there were even uh, very few rural, like traditional farms around, and uh, so there was kind of this. There were no infrastructure there or, or a life uh, that were dependent on perhaps uh, the urban center. So they, in a way, became part of the urban urban core, or so to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, we, we like we with the with the almanac thing. We just expand this to the old planet, right? We were talking with uh, Nico Katsikis, Nikos Katsikis uh, the other week, and he has this interesting concept of operational landscape and he just takes the famous uh, uh, statistic of 70% land for 3% of cities um, and then he weighs in saying that in aggregate terms uh, most of the built environment uh, is not in the cities but it's outside of them right especially if you consider the artificial environment yeah yeah especially if you consider like a crop field as a, like a, a built a built thing that's a it's just a, like you don't see it because it's completely infrastructural. It's well, you know, masked because there are plants in it. But that's a, that's like a huge built environment. So we we really believe that, you know, farm cities that there is a gradient and it's very hard to draw boundaries. And I don't even know if it makes sense or if if it's helpful. But uh. I, um. Yeah, I think the title of the panel kind of leads us to talk about the implication of farming for the city, but really it's the implications of what goes on in the city that is relevant to the farm. And the farm is most of the planet at this point, uh, you know, primarily because of, of cattle grazing and commodity crops. Um, and this has historically been the case, you know, this kind of recursion between you know, one item being missing or not from your plate can kind of shape, reshape vast territories. And this happens at incredible speed. Uh, and that's kind of always been the case, and it's, it's still the case, and it's artificially structured by, you know, farm subsidies, by crop insurance, by uh, whatever uh, far farming technologies are kind of uh, determining, uh, you know, how the landscape is used. Um, and I think, you know, recognizing the connection uh, between the two is also kind of an integral uh, part of the mission because cities are, well, if I say that cities are unchanging, 
Uh, that's, I think, because culture is far more difficult to change than, you know, material uh, environment. And like, this is why I mentioned social technologies earlier, because I think really that'll be the point at which uh, transformation really starts to take place. Because at the minute, it's an almost an impossible war of ki a wall of kind of, you know, socialized beef on the one hand and capitalist realism menus on the other. Like that's basically where where we're stuck at the middle. We're stuck in the uh, the middle. We're stuck in the middle. Um, you know, and you don't. I mean, we. we <laughs> I watched people on the stage yesterday kind of, you know, torturing themselves thinking how to bring farming into the city, but if it's the kind of farming that goes on at present, it's 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 catastrophe. You don't want it in the city. Uh you want to change it. Uh and I think the city is connection to the to the to the kind of uh yeah, I mean hinterland is irrelevant as a term now, I suppose, because it is it is planetary in scale. Um and I would argue necessarily so, that maybe we can get into kind of the question of local and, and planetary in a bit. But uh, as a little bridge to, to your work, I mean, we looked at uh, this, this history of factory kitchens in the Soviet Union, uh, which is a really interesting historical moment where, where um, you know, under socialism, or really at the beginning, Russian Civil War, you had a proposal uh, from the Bolsheviks that, that, that housing would be built without kitchens, you know. To, to liberate families from, from bourgeois home economics. And uh, what was proposed instead was a, a mass feeding institute called uh, um, in ty new typology, a kind of rationalist con uh, constructivist typology called the factory kitchen. Perhaps there are some in Estonia, I don't know. Um, but yeah, so what happened here was processing, canning, uh, food, you know, nutritionists, toxicologists, chefs, they had takeout <laughs> windows at the back for people on your way to work, you get a thermos of hot coffee and, and some sandwiches or whatever. Um, pret a manger for communism. <laughs> and then you could, uh, you could eat in a huge dining hall. So all of the kind of liberatory, you know, uh, like we don't like to think of the, the, the kind of ready, ready prepared food as being this kind of tool for liberation, but I think that for many people it has been. And you could eat in a, in a, in a large dining hall uh, kind of uh, as a result. So anyway, there, the point is, and the, these went out of fashion later, but there is a kind of, there are some interesting moments of like bringing at least pro, uh, processing, if not production, closer into the city. And I think also, maybe we don't have time today, but there are a lot of um, interesting kind of small islands of kind of innovation in university departments, in, in startups, in architecture firms, where there are some very interesting ideas that maybe could, could bring farming into the city, but not in its present form. Uh, you know, the, there isn't space. There's a funny paradox about uh, the relationship between the city and the farm. Uh, the farm always has been uh, the place where you produce. And since, I mean, the city has been the place where you consume. And, and seemingly now there's a, there's a kind of uh, hope or uh, let's say promise that if you bring uh, the goods closer to the city, then the footprint is smaller, meaning transportation globally is smaller. Like if we think about Ukraine and how the grain got stuck and all of Africa was supposed to starve. Um, so kind of the idea is that you don't want to have it in the city, but you want to have it very close to the city. So this is a kind of paradoxical because it, farming has a very big footprint. So I think certain innovation needs to be uh, <clears throat> kind of uh, explored in kind of... Uh, even if it's very, I mean, we have some clients that actually want to have a house, which is a greenhouse, which is basically producing all their food as a kind of a prototype. Um, it's very, I mean, now the clients are kind of like slowing down, saying, okay, they don't have the money to heat the building in wintertime because it's, uh, in Estonia it gets cold. But, I mean, there is, a, there is a kind of lifestyle that says that food has to be around you. And I think once we, the people still in an urbanizing uh, planet are moving towards the city, and I think it's probably... I always kind of try to think of a city as a kind of more sustainable option to kind of really be condensed in a dense environment, to have everything nearby, to get rid of supply chains. Um, so now the question is how do we actually change this paradigm of farm being on the outside and really kind of have the food in the inside. I don't have the answer to that. But, I mean, Super Green did, but... This <laughs> Is that what you told your client? Oh. Well, I don't have the answer. 
Well, well, he actually came with the answers. He was like, okay, th that's, how, th that's how the tanks look like. That's how aquaponics works. That's what we want to do. That's what we want to... Can you tell us what was in the house? Like, what, what are they capable of growing? Uh, basically, all plant. I mean, basically, it's a greenhouse still. Mm. But, I mean, you don't have cows there. But, uh, yeah, I think he was vegetarian as well. But basically, he said that you can have most of your uh, plant, uh, like vegetables and green from your garden. I mean, and we basically grow up in Estonia with this mentality. Either it's your summer house or your farm that your ancestors used to live in, or it's your suburban home where you actually still have a greenhouse. So this is not nothing new to us. So when we in Estonia discussed that uh, basically you can have your own produce from your own garden, it's like, it's a reality, it's like, it's fine. We have the food in the city, that's fine, let's do it. So it's not so far, but to have it as a kind of mass produced, it's a different story. So I think- Because if you scale energy hungry greenhouses up, it's a bit of a, well, it doesn't work. I guess that's the, the biggest problem that we have with this kind of project. So like yesterday there was this word biophilia that was, it's an extremely interesting concept, and I don't, I don't really understand why sometimes architects have to, you know, push it all the way down from biophilia to solve the food problem in the city, right? So I think that if you want to, I grow vegetables at home. I think it's great. I never thought for a minute, especially like after, you know, realizing how complicated uh, his, like growing his, like I never thought for a minute, ah, I'm gonna solve the, you know, the problem with this but I still enjoy and do it. So I don't know why there's always this need to, you know, make it whole, make it, you know, definitive. Uh, and like, it's okay, you grow a building with plants in it, around it, uh, on, on the side. Uh, and that's just already a great achievement. That's great, right? Yeah, I, I, w I would agree. I think it's uh, it's always a little unfortunate when <laughs> when people take like growing uh, things in their own house as like an infinite solution to all the world's problems because obviously they're much larger than that. And so this maybe leads into our next question, which we were all talking about. Um, uh, so do you, uh, again, part of the panel's description was uh, about new forms of localization. And I think uh, you're all talking about this kind of maybe very, very specific form of localization to the scale of the individual versus the scale of mass farm, mass agricultural farming. Um, but do you agree that localization is a good strategy to develop cities and farm, farming practices that develop a circular economy? And maybe even what is a circular economy to you and what, and what you look at? Um, because, yes, like I said, I think it's, it, it can lead you into certain kind of paradigms if you think of only within a certain scale. Right, so I don't know who wants to tackle that. <laughs> I mean, we <laughs> please. We explore already the the concept right now, so I like, already said most of the thing that I wanted to say. <clears throat> I just maybe want to add that it's an extremely appealing assumption, right? The local equals sustainable. Like it makes sense to our brains for some weird reasons. Maybe because we like we love like binary thinking. So if global and industrial is the problem, then local is the solution. And uh, well, I, yeah, I mean, I grew up with slow food. Like I was born the same year in the same region in Italy as slow food. So for me in my teenagehood, going to McBoon, which is the burger chain alternative to McDonald's, but approved by slow food was the big deal, right? Like they are doing the, 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 the greatest thing. And then doing the research for the almanac, I just had to, you know, all my beliefs collapsed. And it's like, no, what slow food uh, is doing is not that much different from McDonald's. There, there is like a quote by uh, Jose, the chef, Jose Andres, that is, saying, is defining McDonald's as a genius of uh, organization, development and marketing. And that is true for, uh, for, uh, for slow food as well. They're just taking the product of my neighbor and they're just like shipping it to New York to sell it for an higher pri uh, like a much bigger price to, you know, to, to some, some people that legitimately want to experience that. But the moment that you market it has like, we are the solution for the problem. And then I understand that the biggest thing that I can learn from you is how important supply chain are and how important it is to have like a interconnected, interdependent world is then like your, your claim of localization to be the solution like fade away. So that was my rant on slow food. <laughs> it was uh, founded the same year the first McDonald's opened in Rome. Yeah, 1989. 
golden arches. Um, the question is really what we're talking about localizing here. I think bringing in practices of uh, you know gardening, uh, if you want to do it, you don't have to. If you want to grow your own tomatoes, that's wonderful. Um, it can be really beneficial, um, and like you know, nipping out into the garden to get some parsley when you're cooking, love that. However, uh, to focus on localization as kind of the most important uh, or like a really you know valuable avenue for improving the food system uh, is to suggest that geography is is the primary issue, you know, the distance between production and consumption. And I don't really think that there's evidence for that. The problem is farming itself. Um, transport, you know, there are many, many studies that show that transport is actually a relatively small contribution to the emissions, uh, the total emissions generated by food. So, you know, uh, I feel like this emphasis on localization is usually a kind of, comf uh, a, a, in one sense, it's a screen for, uh, you know, I want to focus on where my food is from rather than what I'm eating. Because, you know, there are all these amazing statistics about you'd have to fly a, you know, a bunch of bananas a hundred times around the globe for it to have the same emissions impact as a kilogram of beef. You know, I don't think that necessarily transport is the issue. And of course, we're at a point where the things that can be grown locally are without, you know, uh, underground, you know, uh, energy hungry, green, uh, you know, um, vertical farming systems or whatever, all of which I think are interesting, but, you know, the, the kind of energy economics at the moment, it doesn't make any sense to kind of scale them up yet. Um, but, you know, uh, the, what's available locally is something that historically people wanted to shrug off. They were like curious about foods from overseas. You know, like the country of origin label has this uh, David Wengro, the anthropologist, you know, he's, pro he's kind of cited uh, you know, examples from six millennia into the, into the past of people putting stamps on that says, ah, this is from that particular terroir that everybody desires for their wine or for their olive oil or whatever it is. You know, people have always been curious about food and to now say, oh, you can actually only eat you know, the hand, well, I mean, I'm from the UK, so what, tur turnips and, and leeks. I mean, I like these things, but I also like, you know, Sichuan peppers. So, uh, you know, it's, I think this is, uh, this is very unlikely to happen. So there's a kind of mathematical issue. There's an issue of, like, what's available. There's also the issue of, you know, this kind of... Uh, uh, kind of benign figure of the local farmer that we have, which we can get into the, you know, uh, kind of reality of farmers as economic agents and, and landowners versus, you know, farm workers who are an entirely di different class of people. Um, but also a lot of farmers, wherever we are, I'm sure here today, there'll be farmers nearby who are growing food for export, whose livelihood would collapse entirely if we uh, refused you know, to send things out, which is the corollary of refusing to buy things in. Um, and just very quickly, I wanted to uh, address your mention of scale. Um, I think that we are rightly concerned with the scale of land use in farming. I mean, that's primarily in the way that it's used. This is like uh, probably the most important question uh, to answer in terms of the future of, of, of food production. But, you know, there's, I don't think that there's, sorry if I'm going on to your next question and advance here, but I don't think there's any one scale at which it's correct to, you know, engage with these sorts of questions because all scales interlock. You know, you know uh, our atmosphere was produced because of a random mutation in algae which led to them producing excess oxygen instead of nitrogen. You know, genes change the weather. The, the scales are all interlocked. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I mean, our, I, I, when I kind of talked about, uh, you know, smell earlier, it's precisely because an evolutionary drive towards uh, sweet things leads to kind of the creation of vast sugar plantations somewhere else in the world and so on. But, uh, yeah, I don't think... Um, I'm kind of ranting now, sorry. But I think that, uh, you know, uh, scales, uh, there is no kind of single scale. What's important is scalability, right? Like, it's the ability to think about how scales uh, sort of interlock. And that that kind of almost Kantian uh, proposition of like, I have made a perfect, uh, you know, garden for myself where I can grow all my vegetables and so on. Okay, how much land does that cost? Times that by the number of people, uh, you know, living and those that we know are going to live based on current projections and so on. And what happens to the landscape as a net kind of effect? And this is the thing that we're really incapable of doing is kind of, uh, is kind of asking ourselves if our lifestyle were to be uh, kind of, uh, you know, scaled to the population, what is the net effect? The reason we grow bananas in Colombia and not in, 
in, in Tallinn is because they grow there efficiently. <laughs> Uh, and the well, shipping some, is some way less, <laughs> and the shipping is way less than the the, the carbon cost of um, of uh, erecting enormous. Tal oh yeah, you mentioned Talon bananas, didn't you? I'm so sorry. Um, I'm sure that will be the exception that proves it. Yeah, you see, you see where I'm going with that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't know if you have. I just maybe quickly want to talk about kind of local problems and I think the super green uh, well, the political promise was that it's going to fix the local problems but uh, it kind of brought us to ask a question about how to fix modernist problems and I'm and I can be critical of the campaign because I've, uh, kind of, I am the author but I'm not because I'm also kind of reflecting on kind of politics that kind of make such campaigns uh, I think supergrid is a very modernist idea, kind of implemented in a kind of modernist uh, cityscape. I mean, Lasnama, before it became this uh, prefab housing district, actually was a farmland. And uh, now it became 200,000 people uh, living in very kind of uh, um, idealistic sameness of an apartment and then having a car, driving it through the canal to the rest of the city as a kind of modernist idea. And this uh, kind of local fixing problem is that we insert now a kind of central public space into this modernist way of living. So that's what uh, Supergreen was trying to also do, to kind of have the canal refought as a, not just a kind of transportation corridor that everyone takes daily, but to have it as a kind of greenwash corridor that everyone kind of focuses on a kind of daily basis. There's no merit to it in reality, but that. Uh, I think just to kind of un understand what kind of modernist living means also today still. Can I quickly add one last thing? Sorry, I know I talked for ages. But I, I think where the local... I, I don't want to give the impression that the local is not important in, in kind of uh, what I'm describing here. It's extremely important. And I'd say one of the ways in which it's most important is understanding the ecology of the soil and the climate and, and you know, all those things where wherever food is being grown. It's just that I don't want to pretend as though the place that's closest to me is the best place to grow food, um, f even from my perspective as a consumer necessarily. But, uh, you know, uh, there's so much that still needs to be discovered. And the soil is the kind of great unknown of of kind of agriculture. Yes, of course. And I think um, even though we're, we're coming up on time, but if I just wanted to mention even the scales of localization that involved um, the ability to build those, uh, those summer houses with the storm in 1967, I think is a really like beautiful indication of that kind of localization. I don't know if you want to speak more on that. We have a couple of minutes. Are you... <laughs> Well, not about that. I was think, actually thinking from my point of view or from, the, from my practice, what perhaps is a metaphoric take on uh, localization, just trying to, you know, make it useful for myself. Uh, uh, perhaps, you know, me as a scholar in humanities, uh, I mean, about how localization is good, how it brings about uh, positive changes that, uh, I mean, we work with circulating ideas all the time. Um, and what localization of those ideas, you know, makes is that um, it gives perhaps certain vitality to uh, the concepts we work with and, um, you know, keeps them going on, changing them a bit, altering them a bit. Uh, this is what makes those so interesting and this is perhaps, you know, a platform where the dialogue, uh, you know, arises. Uh, and I don't mean locality here as a kind of a geographical term perhaps, but uh, or a spatial term, but perhaps even at this, you know, uh, a location might be another discipline or... Uh, so, yeah, um, you know, I went, moved away from food uh, for a moment, but... <laughs> Intellectual <Yes>. food. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, I, we're, we actually have run out of time, and I wanted to offer anybody who had a question in the audience, if you have one question, um, please jump up. But if not, <laughs> I think we're going to close it. Oh, we have one question in the front, if, if that's okay. Uh, yeah, maybe it's a bit difficult if you are running out of time, but I was just uh, uh, trying to offer an alternative interpretation of the title of the panel of the farm and the city. When I was listening to these uh, uh, presentations from the Soviet Union that is kind of planned economy to the nowadays uh, uh, populist politicians who kind of think about the 
voters as a bit like sheep. And I started thinking that what about if we would interpret the current city as a farm where the people are the animals who are being farmed for intellectual capital, for example. Uh, uh, for example, I mean, if we would step a bit out of our usual anthropocentric thinking, where we would think that people are the top, uh, aren't we just uh, uh, yet another species in the same pattern? And what would that mean for, for city planning and architects and so on? <laughs> Just a question of then who is the farmer, if we are the farm animals? Uh, that's um, basically, well, yeah, if we are talking about uh, populist politicians and so on, then they would think that they are. But m maybe this is the question of how we are thinking about our actual farms. Uh, if we are thinking about our food production as uh, the humans being the top planners who just create large monoculture farms, then this is the dystopian version. But if we are now starting to think about the ecological farming where the uh, species are kind of more interacting and more have more agency and more freedom, then this is kind of the equivalent of more democratic cities, but still. <laughs> Well, I think that's a very good actually lead into our next panel, so which is about far, a farm and the species, I think is what it's called. So exactly. maybe you can have some answers for your questions in this in this next panel. Unfortunately, we are out of time, but um, thank you so much, everybody, for being here, and thank, thank you so you. much to our panelists. It's been great. <laughs>